is it raining outside? I don't know much, but I know that it is a uh, it's raining or it's not raining. One of those options has to be true. That's obvious. That's so obvious that Aristotle made it one of the foundational principles of his logics. A sentence is either true or the opposite is true. Tertium non dater, there's no third option. Now, some people wanted to dispose of this principle. Take this sentence. The current king of France is bald. Of course, France is a republic, therefore there is no current king of France, therefore this sentence is false. But according to that principle we just mentioned, the opposite has to be true. The current f king of France is not bald. But there is no current king of France, therefore the opposite can't be true. So this sentence is not true and it's not false. So if it's neither, some people suggested that it's meaningless. You know, like the term current king of France does not refer. And since it doesn't refer to anything, and it doesn't have a meaning. So it's meaningless and that makes the sentence as a whole meaningless. But we can still understand that sentence and we take it to be false. Why? In a now famous paper from 1905 on the notation, Russell proposed that we should understand names such as the current king of France, not as proper names that would individually refer to some object in the world, but rather as descriptions that are associated with that name. So the current king of France is simply an individuum which has the property of being the king of France and it's also the only one that has this property. Russell expressed that as if an individuum has that property, that individuum is identical with the individuum X. So, you know, it's only one because identity. And now we ascribe to that same individuum X the property of being bald. So if we deny the truth of this sentence, we deny it as a whole. There is no such individuum that would have all the properties listed here. Notice that this formulation is entirely general. It only says that there is some X that satisfies all of the descriptions, but it does not say what X refers to. Indeed, for Russell, names have no reference at all. Their meaning is simply the sense in Fregean terms, the truth conditions of the logical form. When we deny this sentence to be true, we don't deny the French king the property of being bought. Rather, what we're saying is there's no individuum that would satisfy all of the conditions that are laid out here. So what we're saying is it is not true that there is an individuum that would be the current king of France and it would be bought. The problem solved, Aristotle's principle solved, also called the law of excluded middle, by the way. A sentence is true or the opposite is. Now with Russell, language becomes a tool for describing the world as a whole, not like just a collection of words that would individually refer to various things. If we say that God doesn't exist, we're not first referring to some God and then ascribing him the property of non-existence. We're simply saying that there's no individuum that would have the property of Omnipotence, omniscience, and omnibenevolence. There are certain traps in our language that lead us to make various metaphysical commitments, and of course, Russell wants us to see those traps and we can do that by translating the discourse into some idealized language that would make it apparent what we are actually describing and talking about. In a very interesting paper on systematically misleading expressions, Gilbert Ryle illustrates some examples where natural ordinary language messes with philosophical ways of thinking. For example, somebody says, ah, I've got an idea and then it almost seems like you have like a thing called an idea manifesting in itself, like in your brain. 
and you're like, oh, what? You know, you know, we could rather just say like, ah, oh, I have figured something out or something like that. Or like we have like Socrates talking about how he felt pleasure when he like uh, was on the symposium or whatever. And then Plato is like, oh wow, the, 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 the thing called pleasure was imminent in his soul as he was feeling that or whatever. Or I see like, you know, my girlfriend and I'm like, oh, she is bestowed with beauty. As if, as if like beauty is some you know thing that is like out there and it's like radiating itself onto this earth and then you know you see it radiating from something the forms of the beauty I don't know so the idea of ideal language is simply to give people a tool to express their thoughts more clearly and systematically which would form the basis of any you know large-scale effort of investigating the world such as science. Next time we're gonna talk about Wittgenstein's Tractatus and how in it he gave like a picture of language that's like very beautifully explicated and also like some of the ideas he had afterwards and some problems and you know just stay tuned. Crazy outside. Oh wait, 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 wait. Where this? Everybody is wearing them. Your hands. You should use this. And maybe even this. Okay, maybe some other time. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> welcome to Baby Flapula. Everything's contaminated outside. Platonic forms, angels, square circles. We need to protect ourselves from the metaphysical speculation that's going on outside. That's what's dangerous outside, right? That's what you are afraid of, right? What else would there be? We sometimes conceive of language as this magical device that kind of picks out objects in the world. And as we broaden our vocabulary, we actually gain some additional metaphysical access to some special areas of the world. So what we need to do, of course, is to demystify this conception of language and save philosophy. And that's why we need Bertrand Russell. <laughs>